Thank you for joining us tonight. First off, I'd like to again thank the Falmouth Historical Society Museums on the Green for hosting us tonight. It's just a wonderful space to um, be and have our talks. I'd also like to welcome Kim Comart. He's here somewhere. There he is. <laughs> and um, the members of the Falmouth Ponds Coalition. Thank you all for your work. Um, they were formed in 2022 with the mission to protect and preserve Falmouth's ponds, which need protection. They are working hard to educate our citizens about the threats to our beautiful ponds and the ways to keep our ponds healthy. A new town freshwater ponds advisory committee has recently been formed. If any of you are interested in serving on that committee, um, there are materials and information on the back table, or you could just talk to Kim. <laughs> I think he's, he's uh, recruiting. Um, the coalition is working with the town to design and organize a study of re, uh, reducing the amount of phosphorus from entering our ponds in the first place. Such important work. It's, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening to some of our ponds. Um, the 300 Committee Land Trust, that's us, we're nearing our 40th anniversary. Uh, we were started, um, I know, can you believe it? I mean, God, I'm getting old. Um, we uh, started with a small group of citizens who wanted to give a gift to the town for its tricentennial, and hence the 300 Committee. That's how we got our name. Um, the committee did not stop at the 300 acres, and over the last 40 years, we've helped the town purchase about 2,600 acres of open space from Waukoit to Woods Hole. Yay! <laughs> Our big, big news is the purchase of the North Falmouth Woodlands, 56 acres of land in North Falmouth, Seven of those acres will be redeveloped for affordable housing designed and built by Habitat for Humanity. So the project meets two of Falmouth's critical needs, land conservation and affordable housing. It's a wonderful project. The Outreach Committee has a little challenge for you, actually a big challenge for you. Uh, it's called the 300 Mile Challenge. We invite you to walk 100, 200, or 300 miles on our open space. Uh, we have two ways for you to record your mileage. Uh, one is on our website, and then there are also sheets back on the table there that you can do your own you know, recording. And um, we have, um, also there's stuff at the office if you need to go there. Um, and we'll acknowledge those um, who meet the challenge at our annual meeting and in our newsletter and with little gifts, just saying, they're nice. And we have several friends who've already met, three, who've already done the 100 mile part. Whoa. I know, isn't that great? And um, so they'll have to, they, they'll get their first gift as soon as they're, we have, they're, they're ordered, we just have to get them. Um, many of you are members and we thank you for your membership and your support over the years. If you're not a member, um, I, we hope you'll consider joining. Um, our talk tonight is about cyanobacteria, which is threatening the ponds, both in Falmouth and all of Cape Cod. Our hope is that we'll learn about this dire threat and understand what we can do to prevent it from getting worse and join in the efforts with the Falmouth Ponds Coalition. Um, and now I'd like to introduce um, our 300 Committee President, Dr. Joanne Morimoto, and um, she's worked very closely with our speaker tonight, Dr. Julie Hambrook Berkman, at the Association for the Preservation of Cape Cod. And I'm saying that so clearly because the la another talk that we had, people came up and said, what's APCC? And so, the Association for the Preservation of Cape Cod. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. All right, thank you. Allison, is this right? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, I'm Joanne Muramoto. I'm the president of the 300 Committee. Uh, I also happen to be the director of science programs 
at the Association to Preserve Cape Cod. We actually changed our name uh, in 2000 from the Association for the Preservation of Cape Cod uh, to the Association to Preserve Cape Cod. Still the same initials, but thank you. So um, thank you for attending uh, tonight's uh, presentation and for your support of the 300 Committee. Uh, you may ask why um, we're featuring a talk on ponds and cyanobacteria and um, partnering with uh, Kim Cobart. And the answer is really clear and obvious from decades and decades and decades of research. Preserving open space helps to protect water quality, plain and simple. So um, now uh, I, I just want to throw that pitch in there. Uh, so at least in case you may have forgotten. Um, so now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Julie Hambrook. She's a colleague of mine at APCC. Dr. Hambrook is the project manager for two very large monitoring programs that are Cape wide. Uh, one is the Cape Cod Regional Pond Monitoring Program. Um, funded by the Cape Cod Commission under the county's freshwater initiative. And the second very large uh, monitoring program is APCC's cyanobacteria monitoring program. I'll say a little bit more about them uh, shortly afterward. Um, uh, Dr. Hambrook is eminently qualified uh, to fulfill this role of managing two of APCC's largest uh, water monitoring program. Uh, she worked for years at the U.S. Geological Survey's National Water Quality Assessment Program as an analyst and uh, trainer and, and looked at uh, water quality and the effects of land use on water quality in a national program to look at water quality uh, in the U.S. Um, she is also a um, she has also um, been a president of the Ohio Lakes Management uh, Society, where she worked with the Ohio State EPA to build a citizen monitoring program for monitoring ponds and to uh, bring support for that important program. And she has also worked as uh, part of the EPA's Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative, which is a collaborative of um, nonprofits and government agencies formed by EPA Region 1, our region in the uh, New England area, to um, foster and promote cyanobacteria monitoring by watershed groups in order to promote awareness of uh, the health threats and the ecological threats uh, posed by cyanobacteria. So um, she's got a lot of experience, and so uh, the two programs she's managing uh, the pond monitoring program, are you going to talk about the yeah. scope of these? Okay, so I'll let you talk about the pond monitoring program and the cyanobacterium monitoring program. And so without further ado, here's Dr. Julie Campbell. I am so pleased to be here. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. It was a year ago, just a couple weeks ago, that uh, Kristen Anders gave a talk on, on loving your ponds and how to take care of them. And that's when I showed up. I didn't know what APCC was either. And, uh, and so she mentioned at the end about cyanobacteria. And I went up after. I said, do you know about Region 1 EPA? And she said, yes. And she said, do you? <laughs> I said, do you know Hillary? She said, you know Hillary? I said, yes, it's a guy. <laughs> so she said, we just put out four applications. You should apply. <laughs> and two weeks later, I had the job. And so and this is, and they asked me for uh, when I might want to give my talk. And here is just one year later, and it's the 29th of February, so I couldn't resist. You know, like, when's, when's that going to happen again? So, and it's, so it's just been one year. And um, what Joanne was mentioning is there's two projects. And so I'm going to figure out, there's the arrow. There. So you can see here. Uh, that I'm, I'm going to mention first the what I call a 50 ponds project, which is from the Freshwater Initiative, and uh, that's what 
basically hired me because the cyanobacteria program had already been going on since 2017. But this was a brand new program and it needed someone to come in and, and, and lead forth uh, and work with the commission to decide on 50 ponds to represent Cape Cod. Now, you, you may know there's 890 freshwater ponds on Cape Cod, and, uh, and there were a list of over 1,000 before, but that was including the saltier ponds. So they narrowed it down to 890, of which some of those are also a little salty. So then the process of how do you choose 50 ponds was uh, very interesting. And so we had all, if you look at the pond atlas and the pond view, you can see the details on all of the ponds there. They have um, done the 100 and the 300 uh, buffer around these ponds. And so you can look at the development of the ponds and um, all sorts of things. You have the depth, you have the width, you have um, the restoration projects that have gone on. There's a lot of things in the database. So we use that and then we wanted it to be spread out across all of Cape Cod. So we have 15 towns. And so we looked at shallow ponds and deep ponds and certain gradients of development. So that project got started last year and yesterday I managed to send off to every single town all of the data that we collected last year. So that was like, yes, <laughs> I got my first year done. <laughs> and uh, so then moving along to what the topic of the day is on the cyanobacteria program, um, which started in uh, 2017. Um, and before I get into the program itself, because my background was in phycology, which is algae, um, and because the cyanobacteria really get a bad rap, you know, <laughs> they're, they're really bad for the ponds. But actually, there's a lot about the cyanobacteria that are worth knowing to understand their ecology in the ponds and to understand how we got them here. And so the way I'm going to present today is I'll tell you something about cyanobacteria which you may feel like you're back in your college class with some of the terms and things. Um, and then I'll talk about the program and then I'll get back to how the, the two programs connect at the end. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, good, I'm talking loud enough. Well, this is, I, I don't know if any of you uh, are interested in the long-term history of the earth, but this was a big event when these cyanobacteria showed up because it was an anoxic. There was only 1% oxygen in the atmosphere. 3, 000, 3 billion years ago, this, they, fig, the, they figured out how to make chlorophyll A and other pigments so that they could take the sun and do photosynthesis and produce oxygen. And so, and the evidence is in the fossil rocks. There's also um, toxins that they have in the rocks. So it, they, evolved a long time ago and probably had nothing to do with us, you know, in terms of what, why did they develop these toxins back then? Um, the way they f found these as the oldest um, macro fossils are in, on these rocks that are called stromatolites. So if anyone is fascinated by this as I am, then you can have an excuse to go to Australia. Shark Bay, Australia. It's on the northern coast of Australia, and that's what the beach looks like. It's, it's got these huge rocks, and if you slice through them, you see the layers and layers of these cyanobacteria that are billions of years old. It's fascinating stuff. <laughs> when, when I learned about rainbows and the, the waves of light down here, so that, you know, UV, if, this is visible, right? right? So then if it gets narrower, then it's UV light, which you don't see. And, and these are the, the uh, red wavelengths, which are broader. And, and beyond that, you've got um, radio waves and heat waves and other things that you can't see, but you can feel. So it's all wavelengths. Well, these, the red wavelengths, when you're in water, it's one thing to see them in the air, but in water, they come out first. They get in the water, they're big and fat, and then they get taken out. So that the algae that are on the surface with the chlorophyll, you know, they can photosynthesize up there, but if you're, they're further down, they're not going to be able to because the light's already, the light that they can use is out. So that the, the cyanobacteria, they developed other pigments so that they can capture light all the way down. And so I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Um, so the other thing is they are bacteria and not uh, eukaryotes. So by being bacteria, they don't have all these other organelles, and that's where it sounds like you're back in high school. But 
So inside those cells, this is, um, that's your chloroplast membrane, and that's the chlorophyll A. But what the cyanobacteria have is they have what's called accessory pigments. So if any of you get any of these reports, and they, they talk about phycocyanin, what's that? Phycocyanin is this blue one. The red is phycoerythrin. So they have these different uh, re accessory pigments to take in the light. And they get them, and then they shunt them through to the chlorophyll. And then, so this is one Golicchia tri trichia, and that one is looking pink because it has more of the phycoerythrin. And then the other one is this uh, Golosferum that has uh, is on more of the blue-green color. But they use those pigments in order to capture light. And then the other thing that they have. You can tell me. Oh, okay. okay. Next. Yeah. The other thing is because they're prokaryotes, they don't have a lot of other things they have to divide, and so they can divide rather quickly. So as long as they have light and temperature and nutrients, they can do up to three divisions a day. So this is when the blooms show up, they can go very quickly. So they can divide and, and they can grow really quickly because they have an advantage of being just a bacteria. Bacteria can grow faster. Next. So this is one of the, my favorite slide, actually, <laughs> because it shows the distribution when it's just a normal distribution of, you know, you look out and it's green and there's lots of speckles in the green. Um, but this, the um, cyanobacteria have um, air um, bubbles that they create, gas vesicles, and so they can go up and down in the water column. They can rise up, and so when it's early morning, they're there, and they can capture the light, and then they get a little heavier after they make the photosynthesis and make the bread, and they sink back down and avoid um, the grazers. And, but when they're up on the surface, generally in the morning, if the wind comes along, it will blow them to the edge. And I, for those of you who have had experience the cyanoblooms, they usually show up with a rim of green along the side, and that's how it happens. They're going up and down, they, they buoyant, if the wind comes along, and then they blow to the edge of the pond, and that's why. You, and so, um, next. This is uh, Delicospermum, which is, we call it DS for short, but those little white spots that you're seeing, those are the gas vesicles. They also have heterosis because they can take nitrogen out of the air in case there's not enough nitrogen. They can make, they can use the nitrogen from the air. And the other things, those are like, like seeds. They're their aconites. They can drop them, so they can live through lots of conditions in the sediment and then pop up when, afterwards. So next, um, this is all Delicospermum. That, that one that you saw, it looked like a little thread of orange. The, and um, Mindy's here. She was here last year. Oli um, Becker over on uh, Martha's Vineyards making a, a video about um, a movie uh, about the cyanobacteria and, and the communities that are affected by it. So he came out on one day last year, and the day he came, we visited um, this pond, and this was the biggest bloom that you could see, and they had a drone, and so they took the picture that day. It was, it was perfect, you know, it lined itself up perfectly for the video, like, I you wouldn't have been able to get a picture like that, and that's, it's in West Hartford, called, uh, I mean, it's in Harwich, it's West Reservoir in Harwich, this one, but this pathway here is where the dogs walk, and um, the story of this later on, and later on this bloom, the, uh, the health agent in Harwich gets a call, my dog is sick, you know, what shall I do? Well, there were signs up. Did you see the signs? Yes, I saw the signs. So do you, so what, they did not, <clears throat> they, they let the dog go in and play in the, the water and it got sick and they did take it to the vet and so what do you do with the vet? Next. Um, so the one you hear the most about isn't Delicospermum, because that's a little hard to say, but it's, it's microcystis, and that's what microcystis look like under the microscope. It's unicellular, but it's held together by um, a lot of mucilage. And then this is another one, Warwichina, which is also single cells, uh, also very common. Those three are all very common around Cape Cod. Next. Um, so this just gives you, uh, they, they come in all different shapes. They're single cells. They're these, Oscillatoria, these filamentous non heterocystis ones, those are, are ones that you often find on rocks um, growing on the bottom. So they're not all planktons. So, um, and then you see Condylicospermum here, there's a with heterocysts, and Phanosomena, that's another really common one. Next, you'll just see some more pictures of them. So that's the microcystis. Delicosperm also forms a uh, 
a uh, curly one. Um, then there's a, a spanazomenon, that's another one. And there's things about the way they're in shape is to prevent um, grazing. If a, a grazer comes along and takes a bite, um, it's like Mickey Mouse and, and the broomsticks. You, you've just, um, you're spreading it out. They're just gonna make more. So they have different strategies, like that, that if a grazer comes along, uh, they can, it won't likely eat all of it, you know, so there'll be more left. Next. So then they've got another strategy, and that's a toxic strategy. And uh, so these, uh, the microcystis that we can measure because of the Barnes to the lab has come and now does the analysis for us. It, it can measure for microcystin, and it is a liver toxin. So hepatotoxin is a liver toxin. Um, and then the, the lycospermum I talked about is a neurotoxin, and it has anatoxin A. So we haven't had any analysis of that um, yet, but that's on our, we're going to do some pilots this year on that. And then there's skin dermatoxins, and then there's this, uh, uh, we call MBAA, which um, was linked in, there's a paper in Italy that you may have heard of, which linked it to ALS, which is not Alzheimer's, but it's ALS. And I don't think they proved that that's the case. It just happened to be a dense um, population where it was present and people got sick. Next. Um, so I, in trying to prepare for this, I have been looking into the history of how we got this program, because I think people are interested in how it got going. It's pretty amazing that we're able to do what we are. In 2017, I guess the oldest record I have, and you may know of others, was in uh, 1998. There was uh, two dogs that died in Nickerson Park, uh, Nickerson State Park, and they didn't know at first what the poison was. So that was kind of the very beginning of um, recognizing that the cyanobacteria could be there and, and causing problems. Um, so uh, the w APCC was doing restoration work and um, they were interested in bringing attention to the extra nutrients that were in the ponds and causing the ponds not to be healthy. And so uh, they were able to get someone to start working in 2017 with the help of US uh, EPA uh, and of you know, University of New Hampshire in 17. By 2018, EPA had already published their quality assurance program, which had all the procedures and methods to, to do to make a proper uh, study. And so we started in 2018 with the same techniques that we're using today. And I'm gonna go through those with you so you can see what we do. Um, and then that carried on. Meanwhile, uh, there's volunteers uh, that bring samples to us from pond groups all around Cape Cod. There's 18 groups that they collect the samples, they bring them to us and we do the analysis. We also hire uh, college students mostly, but we hire summer interns um, and they come and they work 10 hour days from seven to seven, four days a week. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go through that process with you. Uh, in 2022, this has been building up. You have results, towns get the results. What are they gonna say? What are they gonna do? Um, so there needed to be um, put everybody's minds together on these ecological risks and, and the level of risk and how it's reported to the public. Um, for, because ponds are pretty big business besides, you know, being just that you love them and you care about them. But if you're going to say these ponds are uh, in bad shape, then, you know, there's, there's an economics behind it as well. Not all the towns are too excited about having this problem. Um, and so, uh, and then in, so each year we got up to doing about 130 or 140 sites every two weeks. And, um, and then that's where I entered in was in 2003. So at that point we have five summer interns we hired and um, had a great program. And I said before it started, I wonder what will happen if we have a cold, wet summer, <laughs> which we did. So there were really bad blooms um, in the 20, 21 and 22, really lots and lots. And last year was not quite so bad. Uh, next. So this is to put a little life uh, to the group. Um, this was last year's group of interns, and I must uh, thank Lynn Francis, who is uh, the person who's led forth. Uh, she held it together in between people, and she's the uh, pond logistics and operations. Uh, so she she works. She's my right arm, and she 
she manages the interns and she does a fantastic job. Okay, next. So uh, the best thing you can do uh, for uh, <laughs> the public and for the ponds is to, to monitor on a consistent basis. So you have a forewarning of what's gonna happen. You can't just wait till, oh my gosh, there it is, you know, and have no idea. So that's how the recommendation we had from the beginning to uh, do a regular monitoring and to include identification and to look at the biomass and to look at the toxins. Next. So the way we collect is, uh, and the volunteers collect, is uh, for a whole water sample, we use an integrated tube. This is very sophisticated equipment. It's a tube, <laughs> and it has heavy weights on one end. So it lowers it down, so you're actually getting a sample from the whole water column as you lower it down without messing around at the bottom. And then you pull that up and put it in the jug, and you do it a couple of times, and then you've integrated water sample. That's one piece. Next. Uh, then we get a net sample and you throw that out um, about three meters and pull it back and keep it along the surface of the water and uh, so we get a net sample which concentrates it because you want you don't want to just look at the bottle where it's just a little tiny amount of water you can have the plankton be concentrated next and then when we bring it back to the lab this is what our, we finally call a zapper this is a really interesting little thing you put on a bucket at the bottom it's clear and so the zooplankton go towards the light. And the, I just showed you that the cyanobacteria have um, air gas vesicles, and they float up to the top. And so when we want to see what's going on with the, the cyanobacteria, we put it in the zapper for 30 minutes or more, and it sorts it out. And then we can look at a concentration of, of the cyanobacteria. And that's called the bloom forming colonies. When you see these on reports, some people don't know what bloom forming colonies. That's how you get the bloom forming colonies. Next. So um, for the process, uh, the samples get looked at under the microscope. Some go over there. That's the whole water samples. Then you have the net samples. And you also have a PICO sample where you filter it through, and, and uh, you can get the, um, the phycocyanin. This is a, an instrument that's used to uh, analyze the pigments. In order to look at the pigments, we have to put samples in the freezer so that the cell wall will break down and then thaw them and then take that sample and stick it in here and it'll give you chlorophyll and phycocyanin. So then, you, and that's what we use to evaluate the biomass. How much plankton is there? We're using the pigments that are in the plant as the way of accounting for the biomass that's there. Okay, next. Um, this is showing, looking at the microscope and this is the table in our office building where we've been working. Uh, to uh, look at the look at the fluorometers, so it's very casual. Uh, we don't have a fancy lab, no big instruments, um, and but then the recorded everything gets recorded in the laptop, and then I think next you're going to get to see what uh, reports. So we collected it in the morning, we took it, made looked at what was under the microscope, got the the, the phycocyanin from all three samples from the bloom forming, from the water, full water, and from the net samples. And then these are reports. At the end of one day, we can report back to the people of the pond and the town on what we found. And if it turned out that we had cyanobacteria and the cyanobacteria was in a you know, sufficient amount, then, and if it had microcystis, then we'd send a bottle, a separate bottle, that goes over to the Barnstable lab to look at the toxins. So not every sample are we gonna spend money to look at toxins. It's only when we have enough. Um, and so you probably can't see this, uh, but basically it's the pond, is the date, it's the temperature, it's the, um, the, the turbidity of the water, what the dominant genus is, and that's important because when we want to send the toxin sample, if it's not microcystin dominant, we're probably not going to see the toxin. Even though there might be toxins there, we're only able to analyze for that one. So we don't send so many of the others. And then um, it has the amount of um, FICO. So this is a case where some um, green algae scum was found on the shore, had to look at it. If it was cyanobacteria, then we might have had a potential for concern. But it wasn't so it became acceptable. 
So even though we had some uh, 162 and a projection that there might be some uh, toxins, uh, it wasn't sufficient and so it remained acceptable. If it was found that it was a green scum and we were concerned, we'd send the photograph, because there's photographs taken each time we go out of the side of the edge of the pond and of the whole pond, we send those photographs to the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and they respond and let us know. If they think it's a significant bloom, then it'll go to red use restriction and um, if, if not, it'll remain uh, potential for concern. And what's that mean? It means we're going out in one week. We're not gonna wait two weeks. We have a potential for concern. We're gonna go out again the next week and look at what's going on. Next. And so this is, these are the risk tiers that we worked with the health agents to come up with the, the criteria for these. And as I was saying, you've got the uh, Massachusetts Department of Health right here. And in addition to that, those photographs, um, they, they go to the town. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Health also sends them the results. But the town itself can say there's a potential concern. The town can tell us that they are going to put up a use restriction on the pond. We, we don't, if they say they're putting up a use restriction, it goes on our cyano map. We have a map on our website called the cyano map, and that was started back in 2017. I, I, I had to find out from Kristen today that that was part of the very beginning of the program was um, everyone on the internet that goes to APCC can see this interactive map that changes every day with the results that we get uh, from the ponds that we monitor. Uh, next. So this is what the caution sign that the Massachusetts Department of Health came up with. And um, I want to remind everybody here that this, there are absolutely no federal regulations on any of this. None. Zero. I looked it up today. <laughs> it nearly crashed my computer. That's when it went. Um, and also for, but there are four and there's nothing for Massachusetts, of course. But a lot of states have, have had big, big problems, like uh, uh, Lake Erie in Ohio, where I used to live, and uh, drinking water for millions of people. And so they had to come up with their own state standards. And uh, we have put those all together in a table, and we are using that with health agents that are interested this year when we add in anatoxin analysis to understand. We'll collect the sample. Barnstable uh, Lab is willing to um, pilot it and do some analysis. But then if you get the results, what's it mean? What do we do with it? You know, it's not decided yet. Okay. Anyway, if, you get it, if you're around it, wear gloves and boots and a mask, you know, because these also have an aerosol component to them. And that's not fully understood, but it, it is real that those toxins are released into the air. So um, you don't want to be hanging around those areas. Next. Um, so this is where you might see. And if you see anything like this, you take a picture and you can send, let your health department know. You can send the photo to cyano at apcc.org and um, note the location and the day and the time. The photo all by itself is not going to do us much good. But when we get these, if we're not completely straight out, we will go to wherever the location is and pick up a sample because sometimes it's not cyanobacteria, you know. Um, but if it is, then um, we need, then we go out and do the whole thing, the whole sampling procedure, find out how much is there, send a toxin sample in if it's necessary. Um, and all of this you can find on apcc.org. You know, if you go to our website, you will find all these things. Next. Um, so um, this is just to give you an idea that it's not just one pond. It's ponds throughout all of Cape Cod. In 2021, there were, it was in 12 out of, thir out of 15 towns, and 36 ponds on Cape Cod had uh, use restrictions at some point that year. And then the following year in 22, there was 24 ponds that had recommended use restriction. And last year, 
whoa, we only had 13 ponds with youth restrictions out of 890. You know, there were some like Ashumit and uh, West Res, which you saw the picture of before, um, that, and sand to it, sadly, uh, that just have a really bad uh, situation. Um, but I, I don't think, I'd love to think it was because we all did the right thing and therefore there aren't any nutrients in the ponds. So we reduced it and it's all, we'll see what happens this year. You know, if it, 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 it's gonna, spring's gonna come early. Um, I'm a little afraid. I, I got it off really, really easy last year with only 30. And then, but for those of you who are concerned, there's something called a cyano alert. And if you wanna know when the ponds are um, blooming, uh, you can put your name down and you will get it in your email box. So every time we get to a, a use restriction, when it hasn't been in use restriction, a cyano alert goes out to all the people that are on that list so that you get to know. Okay, next. Um, so here we are in Falmouth. So, and we've been collecting the data, as I said, for years. And this is from uh, 20, from 20 to th through 23. So we've got four years worth of data. And what's interesting to me about this is you, you think you're getting an idea that the bloom's gonna happen on 4th of July, or it's gonna happen you know, in the spring or in the fall, or you know, look, look, look at those colors. I mean, the blue is when the bloom's not happening. The yellow is when there's a potential for concern. And the red is when it went to youth restrictions. Now the top one is deep pond. Kim, yes, there's your pond. Uh, then there's Jenkins Pond, and there's the Schumann, which had a bad run last year. And, um, and then there's Mayor's Pond here. And so these feed into the State of the Waters <laughs> reports. And so once a pond has found, been found to have a use restriction, it's going to remain in uh, unacceptable waters for some time because it had enough to get to that state. It means it's got a, a, a nutrient problem. Uh, among. Okay, next. So uh, to summarize the cyano portion, uh, these harmful cyano blooms have occurred in 13 of the 15 towns. Anyone want to guess which ones they weren't found in? <laughs> Numbers of people further out the Cape. <laughs> this is Truro, Provincetown. <laughs> yeah, but every other town has had something. Uh, they are variable uh, within each, each pond, you know, has its own variability, and they vary between years. Uh, and then um, it's just a reminder that they are a canary in the coal mine for uh, ecosystem health. And uh, next, uh, which may be of interest to all of you, is which ponds on all of Cape Cod. So you can see in Falmouth, uh, there are five ponds that are being looked at. And the great thing in terms of bringing these two programs together is all that cyano data had no nutrient data associated with it. I mean, in some cases, the PALS program existed and had one or two samples a year. And in Harwich, there were some that had four samples a year. So there were some ponds that had nutrient data. But for all those 140 ponds, sites that we were doing, there weren't nutrient data, but at least now, this program, we have data from, we're starting next Monday, maybe Mayor's Pond. Um, we're starting in March this year to get this data for these ponds. March all the way through November. It was originally gonna be just April through October, but in October, the, ta ta the ponds hadn't turned over yet. And so because they hadn't all turned over, we wanted to see what the, the profile looked like when it was fully mixed. And so uh, we, we, we monitored the rest of the ponds. And, and so by the end of November, they had, yes? So what criteria do you need for a, for a pond to be on this list to be monitored? Well, that was a process that I went through with Tim Pasikarnas at the Cape Cod Commission our intention to, to have the ponds on this, in this list, it's a fixed list now, but um, was to represent Cape Cod, um, more pristine, more developed, smaller, larger, so that 
as climate changes and we do what we do with development and other things, you'd have a benchmark of what normal was in these ponds. What does a normal year look like? What, what have we represented all the different kinds of ponds? Every pond on Cape Cod, as far as I can see, is unique. I, I wouldn't, I'd be really struggling to find two that were just like each other. So, you know, we tried our best. Um, yes? I, I could you, probably add something about the purpose of the Palm Monitoring Program. Yeah. Uh, it was set up to uh, evaluate the effects of land uses on pond water quality. And I'm sure the uh, ponds were chosen to represent a range of land uses from very pristine watersheds to highly developed watersheds. Uh, also a variety of pond configurations, fish ponds, shallow ponds, uh, et cetera, and so forth, and also um, wanting to include ponds from each of the 15 towns on Cape Cod for uh, geographic distribution. Yeah, did you update the list by any chance, or is it fixed? Right now it's fixed, but I, it's funded through the Cape Cod Commission, and I'm pretty sure they won, they would like, it's funded through 25, so we have this coming year, 24, and next year, and that's funded. I'm pretty sure they would like to continue the funding and expand the program. So if for those that are interested, that feel that there are more ponds that you'd like uh, to have, you, the Cape Cod Commission would love to hear from you. Yeah, and I should say also in terms of the connecting of the two programs, when we started, 32 of the 50 were ponds where we were doing cyanobacteria work. And some of them weren't because they were more pristine and they hadn't been a bother, you know, and so they were not being monitored. But now I put in for another grant with the SNEP, which is the Southeast Region EPA, and now we have funding. So all 50 ponds will have cyanobacteria data for the next two years, at least three months, you know, once a month to have something to connect the nutrients that are in the pond with the result of what are we seeing in the cyanobacteria. Um, next. Uh, so this was what I was mentioning about the SNEP program. I got the money through the SNEP program, which is a satellite program where, that we're looking to be able to do what they're doing in Minnesota, where they have a lake, lake browser. You can go to Minnesota and get on your computer and it'll tell you what the conditions of the lake are because it's interpreting from the satellite. So we're training, oh, wow. we're training the satellite on our Secchi disk data, on, on the turbidity in the water to be able to do it. And there's another one um, that uh, they've been doing across the whole United States on larger ponds that's up and running now, which is daily predicting for the larger ponds uh, and lakes across the United States. And that's through EPA and uh, NOAA, and it's a, a consortium. So, yep, so that's a project that's going on again through 25, 2025, and we'll be using our data from our ponds to feed and train the satellite, and then uh, we may have our own lake browser for Cape Cod Pods. But it won't work for the little tiny ones. Yep, next. And so I have to put a plug in for our pond project because you can all go out in the canoes if you want. Um, and uh, you don't, we're not taking anyone in March because we actually have to wear a dry suit. Because, and I love this fact, is that you can't, federal regulations, you're not supposed to be out on the water if the air and the water temperature don't add up to 100. <laughs> so it's pretty cold out there right now. Uh, and so we have to wear a dry suit. Um, if we're even in the canoe, I mean, we're not going swimming, but if it tipped over, you need to have that. So, uh, so we're not taking volunteers, but by, Mar uh, by April, hopefully it's warmer <laughs> and uh, we'll get the sign up like we had last year. Um, some of you may have gone out. All you have to, and what, this is JT and that's Sophia. This year we have hired a new person who's starting tomorrow in our new f facility. Well, we're working on a new facility, but uh, yeah. So you just show up and uh, you get to go out in the canoe and help them with the monitoring. Yeah. Next. And my, my uh, for those of you who love your ponds, uh, you know, there's the cyanobacteria part and then there's the things that we love about our ponds and there's things that are good indicators of ponds. And so I, uh, we, we take notes and I thought, you know, 
in the database, we should actually have some information about the biology in the ponds. So I am piloting this, um, are there mussels? Check. Are there, uh, you know, this is the Plymouth gentian, you know, so there's in the pond, turtles, there's on the pond, birds and, you know, and insects, and then there's above the pond or around the pond. So you, depending upon your interests, uh, there's two things. There's, there's going to be the meeting of the natural history of Cape Cod. That's on the 9th, for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing. That's at the uh, Cape Cod uh, Community College. There's, that's on the 9th. It's an all-day, well, I guess it only goes till 3.30, but for those. And then the other, um, what was it? Uh, I was going to say. Um, oh, no, the pond network. Yes, so there's a pond network. And, uh, and so one of the ways, there's a woman that in uh, Brewster at the Slough Pond, she uh, took p pictures of things and used iNa uh, iNaturalist. So she made a list of things she thought she saw, sent her pictures, and she created her own account. And so for that pond, she's got you know, at least 100 or more things that she's found, and they identified it. So you don't have to worry about the identifying because you can use iNaturalist. They'll identify from your picture, and then you can make the list of what's around your pond, and you'll have it already in a database that you didn't even have to create. So that's a great thing. And that's really most of what I have to say, so I can go to the last one. And there's some of my favorites. So I, if, if I see otters, I, I then when I went out with the Ologs, if we have Allison's here, we were swimming at Mares. I think it was Mares, yeah. And um, I saw all these mussel shells, and I thought, my goodness, freshwater mussel cells. How did you end up with such a pile of freshwater mussels? It was the otters. Bob, <laughs> Bob, Bob told me it was the otters because they it was the midden, and so. Uh, it's a good thing. So I'm thankful for all the volunteers that work on the Cyano and bring us samples. Um, very thankful to Barnesville County for uh, doing the toxin analysis, which they're going to start to charge for this year. Um, and, uh, and for the 15 town health agents that process all the data that we get through to them. And the wonderful team at uh, APCC. It's great, great people to work with. And thank you for being here tonight. Yeah. Thank you. yeah.